Well, South Africa's best known independent financial advisor, Magnus Haystack, got off to a very fast start this year, if his email to me is anything to judge by. First week, Magnus is on the email sending me the great news that Sean Pesha's Ranmore Fund was, to quote him, quote Magnus, this is, the top fund in the world during 2023. Well done for spotting Sean and his fund early. Our clients are very happy. We've got Sean with us this morning. So there we go. I mean, you can't really ask for a better intro than that, Sean. And uh, what Magnus then did was he showed me your fact sheet, which uh, reads that of 3,100 global peer, uh, sorry, peer global equity funds on Morningstar, there were only two that generated an absolute positive return in 2022 and beat the MSCI World Index in 2023. The one is the Randmore Global Equity Fund. The other one's the Randmore Global Value Equity Feeder Fund. Now, that's incredible, Sean. That's, that's, a, that's an extraordinary. Uh, the last time I remember a South African topping the, the, uh, the leaderboard was Koki Koeman some years back with his financial fund that was the best financial fund in the world. So this is a, this is a great plaudit. I, I know you're not like one to blow your own trumpet. Um, where does it all come from? Look, Alec, thanks. And um, and thanks to to Magnus. And we, we did work with Morningstar because we had an inkling that that was going to be the case. And and I think there are a couple of things. The one is in 2022, the funds that did well in 2022, generally speaking, had a bad 23. Okay, Because the, the, the value funds did well in 22 and most value funds underperformed in 23. And the ones that did badly in 22, the tech-orientated tech funds, did really well in 23 because of the AI. And um, and so we we knew we'd outperformed in both, but more than just outperformed in our in 2022, the market went down 18. percent So if you went down 15, percent you outperformed. That doesn't feel good. We we were up nearly two percent in 2022, and um, and so we worked with Morningstar. You know, scrubbed all the numbers. It, it did. I think it did exclude the US. So it's Europe. Uh, Africa, M the Middle East, um, you know, Asia, all those things. So any funds running out, out of London and Paris and Frankfurt and Geneva and Singapore and Hong Kong, all those, South Africa, Cape Town, Joburg, you know, those were all included and there were 3,000 funds. Okay. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so we, you know, we're very pleased and I guess, you know, how do we do it? Um, and there are a few things. You know, we only have one fund, so we really focused. And the feeder fund in South Africa, the one on the BCI platform, feeds into our fund. So we just got one fund, one pot, and we don't do segregated mandates. If a if a sovereign wealth fund phoned us you know, today and said, "Listen, we'll give you a hundred billion dollars. Can you run a mirror fund on the side?" The answer is no, because we want we want our clients to benefit from scale. So you know, if, they, if somebody wants to give us hundred million dollars, it's going in the same pot. So all our other clients can benefit from the lower fees, yeah. Um, and uh, and so we and it keeps the admin light and all the rest. And the benefit of a global equity fund is that we can move around. So when Europe's selling off because of the Ukraine war, well, we can take advantage of that. When Japan is offering great value, we can take advantage of that. When uh, you know when when China is is selling off, and maybe there's opportunities there. We have in a few minutes, but we could do that without the client having to redeem from a Japan fund and require a European fund because every time they move around, they pay capital gains tax if you do a good job. Okay. Yeah, and so it costs in, in presumably it costs in commission as well. But the the point you haven't made is yeah. that your money is also in the fund. So the Pesh household sure. uh, will be smiling after two very good years, I presume. Uh, and and I know you did treat yourself. So before we go into the detail, you came to our part of the world, yeah, in the Overberg, and you actually went to a place called Grootbos. Come on, tell us a bit about it. You know, Alec, we had, so Marilyn and I have been married for 25 years, it was our 25th anniversary, and that fine man, Rory Stain, when I was at the last business conference, he said to me, sure, at some point you've got to go to this place called Grootbos. It's the most amazing place I've never heard of. Okay. And so I thought, okay, well, look, now let's, let's, let's do that. And we had, look, just generally in Cape Town, we had the most amazing holiday. It was so hard getting on the plane. I've got to tell you, hardest stuff. Uh, you know, You've been going I, back to the UK. Oh, get back here. It's freezing. I mean, 
you know. So it, we had the most amazing time. And the people we met were just wonderful. But what was most inspirational about our whole holiday was going to the Fruit Wars Foundation. Now, the Fruit Wars Foundation is aligned to the hotel. And it's what the hotel have, um, you know, it's their community program. And they've got four parts that which they focus on, conservation, sport, entrepreneurship, and green futures. And, you know, what they've done is incredible. I mean, they've got six sports sites. They provide sports facilities to 9,000 youths in the Oppenberg area. They've got a, a guy who's, you know, is a brilliant canoeist who I think I'm right in saying is going to represent South Africa, was a good chance of representing South Africa at the Olympics. This is one hotel in one area. And we left there thinking, you know what, if every town and if every company, medium-sized company, started a Fruit Foundation, can you imagine the transformation? Okay. So that was so, ins- it, it was just so inspirational. I mean, I've said publicly that we're going to set up a charity when we get to $200 million. We're closing in there rapidly. Um, and we're going to provide, you know, we're going to give some of our money. In fact, more than half the dividends that I received from our business, okay, Maryland, our dividends, that's more than half of the dividends are going to um, to organizations like the Growth Force where we're going to make a difference. We're going to give back. Um, and we feel quite strongly for that. I mean, I've got to stay focused on the fund. All my guys are going to stay focused on the fund. We don't have time to do that, but you've got champions like the Fruit Force Foundation. Um, and, and so I want everybody to just go and have a look and learn from those guys because this is what one hotel is amazing. Sean, I'm so inspired by your example. I remember at the Biz News 10th anniversary, you said, find me a good cause that I can contribute to. Now, there's not many people, I can assure you, uh, that we engage with at Biz News who have that mindset. And now you found one, um, you are going to be following through on your world, word. So great stuff. And, uh, and, and well done to, to Groot Boss for, for what they are doing as well. That is, that's quite an inspiring story. So there's, a, there's an Oscar Chalupski somewhere who was yeah. pulled out of nowhere. I, I guess he probably hadn't even seen a canoe in his life before. And because of this foundation, just one example, he's now going to be in the Olympics. I mean, what a story. Amazing. And, you know, we've got a holiday house at uh, Tierbottes Kirk from the town nearby as well. Well, we've got a dam. Where are our canoeists? We've got mountains. Where's our Fainbos conservation thing? So, you know, we I met with some some people on the uh, who are doing amazing stuff in the community in Villiersdorf. We're going to start a Villiersdorf foundation. We're going to learn from the group boss guys. So we've just got to find champions, bit of energy, you know, but as a good friend of mine, James, says you can only eat so much sushi. Good point. So, <laughs> right, anyway. And I've got to ask you, because this okay. is really the most difficult question that you're going to get today. Okay. A year yeah. ago, yeah. you and I had a conversation about the well, big look. things that were, the, the surprises that were going to happen in 2023. Yeah. So now I, I can go through them and, uh, and I'll do that very briefly, but pretty much you got them all wrong. I, I can't, you might've got one or two, right? And we, we had 10 and yet you had the best performance in the world in your funds. So, Actually, I'm not even going to go into into those predictions because anybody can, you know, we all got opinions on, on predictions on the big things that are happening. Like you said, Russia would be leaving Ukraine in the first quarter, et cetera, et cetera. How is it that if you've got all of these big stories that are going on in your head that you really believe in, that you that they all go wrong and yet you produce the best returns in the world? Were you actually just having me on a year ago? No, Alec, but I'll tell you, there's a, it's an interesting point because uh, I guess a couple of points, it just shows you macro doesn't really matter. You know, so we bottom up investors. Um, and, and a couple of points. What does that mean? In, just explain so we, what that means. Well, we focus on the companies, the underlying, you know, we're looking for opportunities underlying, you know, regardless. So, so let, me, let me see if I can give you a good example. Okay, I'll give you a good example. Um, so when in probably September, I think it was, the Walmart CEO, said um he, he he came out and he, at some conference and he said we've actually noticed the people who are buying who, who are on these obesity drugs okay are buying fewer snacks and all the stocks all the consumer staples the pepsis and the cokes and all the rest got ham um and and i sat there thinking well we sat there thinking well hang on a second yeah morgan stanley says that seven percent of the u.s population is going to be on these things by 2035 okay and if they are they reduce your your calorie intake by 20 to 30 percent so let's say 25 percent so that's only two percent fewer calories if you multiply the numbers out so so these stocks are down 
yeah, 15, 20%. Now, some of them deserve to be because they're expensive, but but Heinz wasn't. Like I didn't think, we didn't think so. So we look at Heinz and we go, this is getting, a, this is an innocent bystander. It's getting caught up in the mess. You know, all of a sudden you've got Heinz on 10 times earnings with a 5% dividend yield and its largest shareholder is Berkshire Hathaway. And I'm thinking, well, Berkshire Hathaway is awash with cash. He has a business that's quite resilient. Um, you know, we're going to eat, people are going to be eating Heinz ketchup regardless of the economic environment. I um, mean, Heinz beans. You know, if I, if I come home with, with a, a private label bad box of cornflakes, my children are not going to shout at me. If I come home with anything other than Heinz ketchup over here, okay, they'll shout at me, although they have discovered all gold. Um, and, uh, and so you buy this thing and you're up, next thing you're up 25%. So, okay, so you, you, t- you take the, because all of a sudden all the companies then came out with the results going, no, we haven't noticed it. Okay. And so you could just, we were, but we were focusing on the bottom level, not thinking, oh, well, nobody's going to be eating these things and therefore we must sell those companies. You know, well, yeah, but not all of the companies get it like that. So that's one example. So if you focus on the bottom up, okay. Um, and also as a value investor, you know, um, I think I might have used this example before, but if you're not taking a macro bet and then shares sell off because of fears that oil, price is going to fall and you buy the stocks and the oil price do- does fall well you bought them at the lows if the oil price doesn't fall well then you've got a bargain so you've got the asymmetry okay so you know just hopefully highlights we don't have to get the macro right and that's why on our fact sheets we don't write about we think oil is going to do this and the gold price is going to do that and this currency is going to do that etc you know just focus on the bottom up but it's hard everybody's focused on all of that stuff right now and um, just so get- yeah Get away from the emotion. I liked also in that fact sheet how you um, used the analogy of being a good cricketer. Now, just explain how a good cricketer and a good investor uh, have similarities. Yeah, and this is coming from somebody who's not a good cricketer. Um, but, but, you know, if you look at a good bats batter, okay, they, uh, what, what do they want? You want a couple of sixes, you want a few fours, you want some singles and, and some twos, okay? But you've got to protect your wicket. You can't go out there trying to swing for a six off every ball. And if you do, you're going to get bowled. It's just a matter of time. You know, Clive would tell us that. Um, so, so that's what we do. So we don't, so we'd rather have a few winners. But if you look at retail investors, typically, you know, they, they find an idea and then they want to bet the ranch and then it's, you know, it's, uh, it's all or nothing. And if you get it wrong, you get bowled. And so we don't want to get bowled. And so we, we protect our wicket. And when a nice opportunity comes along, Warren Buffett talks about a fat pitch. Well, then you you have a go at it, but um, but you're not trying to hit sixes off every ball. And and the importance, you know, you look at some of our competing funds out there that people have got a lot of money in. I mean, one fund's got Microsoft, Meta, and Novo Nordisk. Can you look at these guys and you think, gee, they must have smashed it last year? No, they underperformed. They underperformed because they got a couple of other companies that got bold. And so you've got to be very careful of losers and. And we had 25 com- uh, positions that contributed more than half a percent. And we only had one that detracted more than half a percent. And that one that detracted more than half a percent gave us more than half a percent last year. So, you know, that's no, Just the explain thing. that. Just explain yeah. exactly what you mean by that. So, so let's say you have a position which is two and a half percent position. Okay. And it of goes up fund. 20%. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Goes up mm-hmm. 20%. Well, 20% times two and a half percent is half a percent. So it'll contribute half a percent towards your performance. And we had 25 of those, okay? But we only had one that lost more than half a percent. And the one that lost more than half a percent gave us more than half a percent last year. Okay. In, in the, uh, this book I'll just show it, I think you recommended it to me and I've been reading it. Oh, good, yeah. Richard Wiser, happier. Terrific Brilliant. Book, William Green. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's one of those, I'm savoring it. Um, I'm I'm zipping through, by the way, Elon Musk's biography, uh, Isaacson. You know, yo, strange guy. Um, but it's interesting. Uh, I, I I'm not sure. I love reading about people that you can learn from, but I'm not so sure what you can learn from Elon Musk because he's so so out there, so out, so much of an outlier. He's just he just does everything so Elon Muskish. Whereas this book of William Green. I'm not zipping through. I'm reading it very calmly and very slowly. And thank you for the recommendation of it. But in there, one of the people, one of your heroes, Howard Marks, that he talks uh, talks about, says that if you can get two out of three 
of your investment bets right, you are going to be a very successful investor. Now, in this past year, you got three out of four, 70, virtually 75% of your uh, portfolio was in front, whereas only 25% went backwards. And the ones that went forwards went significantly forwards. How does one keep that kind of thing rolling? Look, you've got, you know, Alec, I guess it comes back to risk management. And, and hopefully that's what 2022 also highlighted that we, you know, we don't, when we buy a stock, we don't think, will this beat the market? We think, well, we're going to make money from this. Thing. Okay. And, and it's all about skewing the odds in your favor. So if you think, well, if I buy a high quality company, you know, you're skewing the odds in your favor because when they reinvest the cash, they're doing so to higher return. If I'm buying a quality company, you know, same thing. I'm skewing the odds in my favor. If you buy a company with a good balance sheet, you're skewing the odds in your favor. And when you multiply all those out, okay, then the things are good. But you have to pay a good price, okay? Because if you don't, if you overpay for something, all those other positive factors be nothing. And let me give you an example, Nike. Now, no one's going to argue that Nike's not a great company. Powerful. Nike's the same price as it was in 2020. Estee Lauder. You know, the story with Estee Lauder, which has been revered as a quality company and was the top 10 of many of the funds that, you know, many business guys would have owned last year, okay? It's been a disaster. And, and the story would have been great brand and company and, you know, people put stuff on every day and annuity income and all the rest. You needed to buy Estee Lauder before 2017 to be up in absolute terms, terms and before 2011 to buy from the World Index because things went wrong. They got overstocked in China. There's lots more competition. You and I can start a, you know, uh, a, a beauty company tomorrow. What do we need? We need aqueous cream, a bottle, some fancy essences. I, I, wouldn't, a, I wouldn't recommend it, not you and I. I'm not going to, exactly. <laughs> but, but the point is, is that, um, you know, you, you, Rémy, what's it, Rémy Quantreau, down 19% year to date. And the story is, oh, well, they founded 1874 and all the rest, and because they've been around for a long time, it's going to be stable. Yeah, but it's on 25 times earnings. It was on 50 times earnings. So even though you have these great companies, if you overpay for them, it means nothing. Okay, you're going to you're going to lose your shirt. And um, and so that is such an important point, and that's why we think value investing makes sense because if we get something wrong and we haven't overpaid, it's a bit like buying a brand new car. You buy a brand new car, you decide I don't like it, but you paid top dollar. Now when you sell it, you're going to take a hit. If you buy the the car that was the demo model and you decide you don't like it. Okay, you paid a lower price, so you're going to take less of a hit. And that's what we do. So just don't pay for the shiny car. Just be careful of the, you know. Sean, let's close off with China. There is, uh, a, in our business portfolio, we do have process in there. It took an awful hammering uh, in December when the Chinese government brought out a new law restricting the amount of time that gaming companies, i.e. Tencent, uh, are going to get from their audience. And you can do that in China. You can stop people from playing in the gaming area. Uh, and that share price has recovered a little, but it's still down a long way from where it was. Process is in many South Africans' portfolio. Process stroke nice pass. Are you giving us some good or some hope about what will happen to that stock in particular and actually Chinese shares overall? You know, and if we don't own process um we don't really like that you know i mean i've been quite outspoken about nasca so i'm glad to see that they're unlocking value because that helps you know that helps the south african saver and 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 you recall a, a, a video a while ago i was quite visibly frustrated about the the lack of that but what's interesting is you know chinese stock markets got off to a rocky start okay and this morning i wake up and all the chinese the market market style 84 percent whatever it is um, so you go, whew, I know the GDP number came out. You know, how bad was it? GDP, October to December, expanded 5.2%. Okay. But it, expectations are 54 But put that aside, you know, industrial output was up 68 Retail sales grew 7%. You imagine those numbers in the South African market. 5% is fantastic. Okay. So it's all versus expectations. And and it wasn't long ago when we were speaking um, yeah, a few years ago, but but look at Alibaba in 2020. Alibaba was at a forward multiple of 30 times earnings. 30 times earnings are currently seven times. It's on seven times earnings. It's gone from 30 to seven. Shareholders have lost 78 percent. So you go, oh my word, what's happened to Alibaba? Things must have fallen apart. No, no, no. Revenues up 20 percent since 2021. Uh, Operating incomes doubled. 
So that's my point. So this is, you know, that was a shiny brand new car on the showroom floor a couple of years ago. Maybe it's a demo model now. Now, you've got to be careful, okay, because the government could do all, who knows what the government's going to do. And so therefore people are pricing in that risk. And and I remember when we were, um, you know, investing in Russia, and obviously that was an error, but you can see in the numbers we've recovered. I go, well, but, but people think Russia is risky. What about China? China doesn't pay dividends and, you know, the government can do anything and all the rest. Of it. And people have got all this money in China and they're telling us Russia's risk. But but maybe the risk is not priced in because there are some good businesses. Now, are we buying Chinese property companies? No ways. But, you know, you've got, you've got companies with strong balance sheets that are still growing on low multiples, maybe it's frosted. And and I think the Chinese government probably got a wake-up call when they saw the response from Tencent and NetEase and some of these other companies uh, because they are employers. And so if they turn the screws on too much of those companies, you know, they invest in venture capital type companies. They're not going to do that. And so that's going to stifle economic growth. So you know, maybe there's an opportunity in China in the same way as there was in Europe. But, um, but right now, everybody, what we know for certain is no one likes China. And you've got to find the diamonds in the dust. And that's why, as active managers, we keep hunting for the diamonds in the dust. And do it very successfully indeed. Sean Pesh is the founder and chief investment officer at Ranmore. I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com. 